My name is Aaron Nelson. I'm the president of the Chamber for a Greater Chapel Hill Carborough, and we are glad to have you all on this call to talk about the payroll protection program, specifically uh, proper ways to spend those funds and how to maximize the likelihood of the forgivability. Uh, many of you all hustled early on and were first movers and have secured your funds, which means that they are in your account. Uh, and now it's become complicated as the rules are changing frequently. Um, and what will be forgiven uh, is super important to you as the eight week clock uh, has begun. Let me say a special thank you and introduce our underwriter and sponsor. Uh, many of you all know Antoine Jackson, um, a very talented entrepreneur who started a technology company uh, that has grown and grown and is now serving uh, organizations throughout our region, actually across the country as well. He's a member of the Chamber's uh, Board of Directors, and I wanted to introduce Antoine, uh, thank him for his sponsorship and his underwriting, and give him a moment to bring welcome. Awesome. Thank you, Aaron. I really appreciate that. So, um, yeah, my name is Antoine Jackson. I'm the president of Inatech IT Support. Um, we're a managed service provider that was founded in 2012, actually in Chapel Hill. Since then, we have grown to serve a variety of small to medium sized businesses with IT support and cybersecurity services. Um, as you guys can imagine, these are some very unusual times for all of us where we're finding that we're relying more on more on technology. Um, so one of the things I just wanted to do was welcome everybody and just like myself, we're all figuring it out as we go and we're all in this together. So, well, Antoine, I really appreciate that. Um, when closer to the end, I will share the website. It is inatechsolutions.com. And uh, Antoine has our full trust and confidence. The, the positive things we hear back from the customers that have worked with him um, uh, are, are really extraordinary. Often people are very grateful for you, uh, Antoine, solving problems that they were having trouble solving on their own or creating a system where they don't have any problems. <laughs> so congratulations for that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's begin our formal program. We are very lucky that the American Institute of CPAs is located here in our community. They are a national organization, one of the largest professional associations in the North America, and now they are an international organization, uh, making them one of the largest uh, professional associations in the world, really setting the standard uh, for the industry and are the people providing advice to your CPAs. Um, and so we thought we'd go straight uh, to, the, to the organization that is giving the information. We have with us two experts uh, from the American Institute of CPAs with us. We have Carrie Hipsack, uh, both of them are CPAs and are technical experts in the subject who are tracking and reading and paying close attention to these things at all times. We sent you short bios for each of them. So we have Carrie with us uh, and also April Walker. Uh, April Walker, uh, some of you have, may have known locally from her previous career with a local firm before she joined uh, the AICPA. Uh, and between the two of them, one in the tax practice and ethics, uh, public accounting side, and in the other one in firm services, um, we think we've got the right folks. We had a pre-call with them, and at that time, I think more information has even come out since then. So we're going to spend the first 30 minutes uh, with a presentation from them, and then lots of Q&A with the rest of you. Uh, so Carrie, April, welcome and thank you. Great, thank you so much, Aaron. We appreciate this opportunity and the warm welcome. I'm going to quick share my screen so we can share some information with you all. Um, we'll just get started. You gave us the quick intro and my slides aren't advancing. Okay, so this is April and I. Um, we just wanted to make sure that you all had access to our contact information. So if you have any questions that we don't get to, um, or if you want to follow up with us next week, feel free to jot these down and save them and reach out to us at any time. Um, we can also include them to Aaron and he's welcome to share our information and, and get us in touch with anyone as well. So I'm going to jump right into our agenda for today because we have a lot of content to cover and want to make sure we get to questions. Um, first, we'll start off with just looking at the status of the environment, so where we are, and then we'll go to the guidance structure. So Aaron mentioned um, we did get more guidance yesterday, and we'll talk about what that means and um, the other types of guidance that we're expecting in this process as well. And then finally, 
we do see a lot of questions come in through the AICPA. Um, we have a hotline set up um, where the questions will come directly to April and I, as well as a couple of our other teammates. And we also do host a weekly town hall and we accumulate all those questions and we look for patterns. So we will discuss some of the top questions and concerns that have been coming up um, to let you all know that you're not alone and um, really get a filtration of everything that, that's coming to fruition at this point. And finally, we'll open it up for an open forum to have a conversation and address any of your questions that you may have came prepared with or you may want to ask after hearing some of the content we discussed. I will jump in with the broad um, status. So the CARES Act and subsequently PPP, which is what we're all here for, um, has been a very hands-on deck process. So we have a number of stakeholders involved with this. There's the government, the business advisors, which is where the AICPA and your CPAs will fit in, and then the information, advisor, information providers as well. So payroll processors, et cetera. And then finally, the lenders. So this started off with banks, primarily in credit unions, and then um, as the pro program progressed, um, fintech lenders were also involved. So we're trying to get everyone's input and make this program as best as it can be um, for all those involved. And this is just a look at the AICPA-led coalition for small business funding. So we have been very active with a number of other organizations to try and bring in as many perspectives as possible perspectives as possible um, to capture as many concerns as possible. So that's all that, that this is for is just to give you a view into who is all involved with our coalition and all of our efforts. So this slide is, is probably not um, news to anyone, right? You know, coronavirus hit and we had the pandemic and the, the subsequent shutdown and employee safety was the priority, right? We didn't all exactly know how things were going to pan out, but we just knew that we wanted everyone to be safe and well. And then phase two of this process was the application um, for um, some type of relief, right? So a lot of, a lot of small businesses focused on PPP. Uh, the funding ran out very quickly, and then there was a second wave, as we all know. And it's still an evolving program, but a number of entities have already received some of their funds or have funds in the work. So the second part of the second phase is to focus on how to get full forgiveness. So what can you spend the funds on and how do you document that so that you can ensure you're in compliance with rules and regulations and are eligible for full forgiveness. Another thing we just wanted to point out um, since this is focused on PPP forgiveness, we assume a number of people on the call have received funds through funds through PPP or will receive funds. However, we just wanted to point out that there are a number of relief options available to businesses, and this is just an overview of them. Um, as I said, you have our contact information and you're welcome to reach out. We do have detailed resources available at AICPA.org forward slash SBA, as well as within our tax section that goes into um, each of these in a little more detail. So I just want to make sure that everyone knows PPP has been talked about a lot, but there are also alternatives. All right, so what we're all here for, right? PPP forgiveness. So PPP forgiveness is still a work in progress. Um, we have done the best we can to interpret um, the guidance that has come out. Um, Aaron mentioned there is this disclaimer that um, we can't give out advice necessarily um, on what your, your business should specifically do, but we do try to um, summarize as much of the content we can and give direction to it. Um, a couple of areas where we have gotten involved in the forgiveness aspect includes the coalition coming up with this recommendation document. So this is a public letter. It started with lenders and asked for clarification regarding the application process. And it's been expanded to include recommendations for forgiveness and the need to have clear forgiveness guidelines. So that is public. It is available at AICPA.org slash SBA. Um, the one thing we want to point out is that this is not all encompassing of all of our advocacy efforts. 
This was done again with that coalition that I showed the slide about earlier with payroll providers to try and at least come up with a consistent approach to forgiveness. Also this week, a joint statement was released with the AICPA and a number of other small business advocacy organizations, again, stressing the need for clear forgiveness guidelines. Um, I, I've said it a multitude of times, but a number of organizations have already received their funds or are going to shortly. And to be able to maximize on forgiveness, they kind of need uh, clear guidance going into it to know how to plan to use the funds. Um, so we are doing all we can to advocate for the clear guidance. And another tool that's coming out this week will be our loan forgiveness calculator. Um, we did create loan um, application calculators to help determine the maximum loan amount. And we have been holding off on releasing the loan forgiveness calculator because we haven't had guidance. Um, however, since we haven't had guidance, we have decided that we will go ahead and release the loan calculator, going through all of our assumptions, citing the guidance where we can, and again, have caveats all over the place, that it is subject to the interpretation of the user until we get clear guidance on these areas. Um, so at least we can hopefully try and provide this tool um, to help with the data collection and the documentation. Um, so I did mention the guidance that we are all waiting for on forgiveness. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to April to talk a little bit about um, the guidance structure and then more of the detail, including the guidance that came out yesterday. Thanks, Carrie. Um, happy to be here. And I, it sounds like we've got a good mix of people um, who this is probably not new information for, but um, when I talk about PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, um, I like to talk about how it came into being and, and why it's so, um, why the guidance is, uh, you know, wh why it's coming in piecemeal. So um, as most of you know, the CARES Act was signed on March 27th. Um, and, and included, along with a lot of other things, uh, the Paycheck Protection Program, um, which provides, the CARES Act said, you know, provides forgiveness for up to the full principal amount of qualifying loans uh, for small businesses that were adversely impacted under COVID-19. And it gave SBA funding and authority to make the guidance. So then, um, we waited and um, how the SBA and U.S. Treasury um, are releasing guidance is they're releasing these interim final rules and there's not one interim final rule. I think there's like eight. Um, there might have been, a, you know, there could be another one that's happening while we're on this call. Um, there's different f interim final rules that are uh, giving information on different on, on different pieces of the puzzle. And then also there are the uh, frequently asked questions, uh, FAQs as they're also called. And that is one document that is, um, again, two were updated, uh, were added last night. So it's like you have to uh, put a link on your uh, browser to that document and keep refreshing because you just never know what's gonna show up. Um, there were, uh, we can kind of talk about uh, the two that were added last night as we're going to talk about uh, the next things, but just just for an overview of that's kind of how uh, this guidance is coming. It's coming very piecemeal. It's coming, um, you know, we want to talk about forgiveness and we want to answer all your questions and we were hopeful that we would have more answers to questions, but um, unfortunately, there are still a lot of questions. So, um, Carrie, you wanna go to the next slide for me? Um, so I'm sure you've heard a lot of um, news reports and uh, questions and things about, uh, oh, so-and-so, you know, Ruth Chris got a, got a loan and Shake Shack got a loan and, you know, all this, um, this information. So, um, with that came uh, the, the um, you know, information about, okay, what does it mean 
what does it mean to certify that you had an economic uncertainty in it in order to make this loan um, necessary? There were a lot, there was a lot of confusion, a lot of questions. Um, you know, then it came out about, okay, there's, if, if you had a loan more than $2 million, it was going to be audited was, was some of the words. Um, for CPAs, auditing means something different than uh, the general public, but basically it means review of the loans. So for loans over $2 million. Um, what came out last night was, okay, if you have a loan for less than $2 million or less, then you are assumed it is, you know, um, a, um, you're assumed to have, to made the certification that in good faith that you needed the loan. Um, if you, that doesn't mean if you received over $2 million that you didn't need the loan, you're just going to have to um, document that you needed the loan and, um, and, and, you know, probably your file will be reviewed by the SBA, not probably, definitely, if it's over $2 million, it's going to be reviewed by the SBA. And, um, you know, you'll have to prove in the FAQs, it talks about, you know, do you, did you have access to liquidity from other sources? Um, and, you know, yes, we would love for that to be a little more clear, but it's just a facts and circumstances, um, uh, and, you know, facts and circumstances decision. So. Get the next slide for me, Carrie. So again, um, spoiler: I <laughs> the um, two million dollars uh, presumed to make the good faith certification loans over two million will be reviewed. There was also a change um, from you know if you if you receive the money and you decided hmm, maybe I had access to other funds. I don't want the scrutiny. I can return the funds. First, the date was May 7th, then it was changed to May 14th, um, and last night it was changed to May 18th, uh, so that's Monday. Um, so again, I don't know if that's, and we can talk in the Q&A if, if there's anybody that has questions or issues related to that. Um, there are some other um, returning the money actually gives you access to a couple of other of the relief options, the employee retention credit, um, because those are getting PPP funds, you cannot use that credit. So there are some other implications um, with returning the money uh, that might be an issue. Um, I just wanted to share this quote from, the, from a blog uh, that was done by, um, someone and that says the last thing our economy needs is small businesses laying off employees and closing up for good because they chose to return PPP funds or not apply at all. So the intent being if you need the money then keep using the funds. All right. So um, rather than go into what has been answered related to forgiveness, um, I, it's almost easier to go through what hasn't, um, because you probably know, you know, 75% of the, uh, of the loan, if it's used for payroll, then the loan could be forgiven. You know, you probably know all those. So some of the open questions and concerns, um, that we have heard, um, about the, um, you know, about the, about receiving the fund and getting forgiveness. So first of all, there was a lot of questions about whether the deduct, the expenses that were used um, for the, for the loan will be deductible. Um, the IRS came out last week and said, okay, those expenses are not deductible. Um, so, you know, that is really not an open question, but there has been some advocacy efforts with the ACPA to try to get, um, a reversal of that decision um, from from the IRS. So um, again, that's that's kind of a you know a question for people. Uh, the forgiveness cliff. What I mean by that is if you don't, for example, if you've only pay seventy four percent of the funds to for payroll related expenses, does that mean none of the loan gets forgiven? Some people have read read the guidance and and come to that conclusion. Uh, we don't believe that that's the case. We believe that um, 
you know, it will, you won't give, receive full forgiveness, but you will receive um, reduction of forgiveness if you don't meet the 75%. But that again, has not been made clear in the guidance that has been provided thus far. Um, also, the, oh, go just ahead, Gary. Just on the example, uh, for, for an example of the forgiveness cliff, assume you got $100,000 in proceeds, we won't deal with interest or anything, we'll keep it simple and you need $74,000 for payroll costs. So you didn't meet that threshold. It is our interpretation because interim final rules do state that the loan can be forgiven in part, that it would be that $1,000 difference between 74 and 75 that would be reduced. So you could still get up to 74 uh, plus other eligible expenses re uh, forgiven but then that 1,000 would turn into a loan after the eight week covered period. Perfect, yes, thanks, Carrie. An example helps. <laughs> All right, um, another question we've heard a lot is uh, for the eight week period, is the, do the expenses have to be both paid and incurred, paid or incurred, you know, is it cash or accrual, that sort of thing. So the, that's a lot of question. Again, we don't have the answer to. It does seem to imply both paid and incurred, but again, does that mean, um, you know, that you can't, uh, you know, how does that work with pay periods? If the pay period uh, is within the, um, if the pay period covers services that were not within that eight week period, does that mean the portion of the expenses within that pay period do not count? Um, you know, what about retirement contributions? Is that, you know, does it have to be only for that eight week period or can it be uh, retirement contributions for a different period? Um, you know, for, this is kind of the second piece about bonuses and retirements covered in the period. Can you increase people's payroll? Can you give them a bonus if you're giving them hazard pay for coming in during this time? Is that covered? We don't see anything that says that it, that it doesn't, but again, that's one of the things that we need guidance on to be able to say for certain. Um, FTE, e, uh, full-time equivalent definition. It does say, um, when it was talking about the, for the application, it indicated headcount. What was our headcount for the, um, you know, to be able to meet the under 500 employee uh, requirement. But for the forgiveness, it talks about FTEs, but it doesn't define what that is. Um, so, you know, FTE is defined in the Affordable Care Act as 30 hours a week. So, um, you know, we can talk about that's kind of what we're saying. Okay, maybe that's maybe that's what it's going to come out. I mean, but again, we're you know we're we're not sure what they're what um, the SBA and Treasury are going to come out and say about FTEs, and that's important because um, you can't have the reduction um, of more than you know your reduction of FTEs reduces your forgiveness. So that's why that's important. Another piece that's really important in determining whether you get full forgiveness or not is the employee by employee analysis. And what that means is, you know, um, was, was this certain employee, was their payroll reduced by 25% um, when you're comparing the prior quarter to the eight week period. So if you have an employee who didn't come back to work, um, whether they couldn't because of health reasons or decided to not to work because they wanted to stay on unemployment. Um, that piece has actually been addressed in an FAQ um, if you've got somebody who refused to come back. Um, you can document that and it's, it will not affect your forgiveness, but that's the only circumstance that's actually been, um, been, been clarified. Uh, if there, there could be other reasons that the employee didn't come back. So, um, you know, or you, you know, the person didn't come back for performance reasons. You know, you, you didn't want them to come back. So uh, that's a big, a lot of uh, discussion about what we don't know. <laughs> so um, I think now 
Is there anything else you want to add, Carrie, related to that? Uh, no, nothing on that. I was going to jump to the open forum right away yeah. to kind of get everyone's thoughts on on those open items. Um, like April mentioned earlier, we were hoping by today we would have had more clarification. And, um, you know, we're nerds. We were excited to see new FAQs and in, interim in final rules out yesterday. Um, and then a little disappointed when they didn't address forgiveness as much as we had hoped. So um, I guess we can jump into questions. Um, now that I'm talking and thinking about it, the one thing I did want to talk about real quick was the FTE uh, discussion. So in our calculator, we do use the 30 hour um, ACA definition, um, but we do also factor in the differences between if you have someone that's salaried or if they're paid for um, like a piecemeal worker, if they're paid, um, you know, on an item by item basis, we try and factor in some of those additional situations um, that aren't the standard 30 hour um, or don't have standard hour reporting. So we have some of those considerations in mind and we're doing the best we can to, to advocate for all of you. Carrie, let me, so Carrie and April, thank you. At the very beginning, uh, well, when we, talk about this, we ask not for the very basic information, right? The folks know 70, up to 25% may be spent on things other than payroll. Uh, but let me do a quick Q&A with you before we open to the group. May you spend 100% of it on payroll? Absolutely. Yeah. It has to be at least seven. Can you describe the non-payroll expenses uh, that may be uh, deducted? I mean, maybe forgiven. Let's be careful with our language. You said deductibility earlier, and you were referring to tax deductibility. Forgiveness, um, what sorts of things may count in the 25% for forgiveness purposes? Sure. So um, just going through the list, you can have uh, mortgage interest payments, uh, rent payments, utility payments, so utilities, uh, depending on how you define utilities, could be broad. Interest payments on any other debt obligations that were incurred before February 15th. Um, so that's... And it, I've seen even broader, uh, they even... Um, if you would unshare for a second, let me show folks where these magical FAQs. So generally, I'm not a fan of federal government websites, um, but let me share with you all uh what she was referring to so on the u.s department of treasury the big red bar that says for small businesses uh, if you do click that there's actually super helpful information and if it's um i was talking to somebody recently and they said oh my gosh it's going to take me an hour to read this and i said how about the federal government pay you a hundred thousand dollars to read this for an hour um, and i think that's a good deal so some of you have gotten a bunch of money it's worth the hour um, but the place right here is these interim final rules and frequently asked questions. You'll see the frequently asked questions is updated last night. There's 45 of them. They are actually really well written. They are many of your questions. I'm not an FAQ fan generally, but they're excellent. It asks very detailed and there's a very detailed explanation even with sample calculators. If you've not read this document, it's worth the read. Uh, and we'll um, be very specific uh, to some of your questions. Again, that's the U.S. Treasury's website in their uh, frequently asked questions. Uh, it is maddening that there's things called interim final rules, uh, and there's a lot of those, but my best advice at the moment, and I hope April and Carrie agree, it's this FAQ at the moment. If you totally want to geek out on it, you can go further into these final rules. Um, is that a fair, good place to send people? Yeah. Um, yes. Let me ask you just a few more of the questions we've been getting, and that is, what may I spend the money on? Um, I'm, it seems that that is a different question than what may be forgiven. Somebody said, may I spend the money buying a car? Yes, it just won't be forgiven. Is that true? Is there a violation if you spend this money on non-payroll and non, uh, is it, can you simply treat it as a loan? And then in that case, what are the terms? Sure. So the loan term for any piece of the PPP funds that are not forgiven, um, it turns into a, a two-year loan at a 1% interest rate. 
Um, so it's quite favorable. Um, technically, the spirit of the program is to pay for costs to keep entities ready to go after the coronavirus impact, right? So that eight week period um, that the calculation is based on was an effort to get through any shutdowns. Um, so in theory, um, if the loan is under $2 million, the use, including the use after it's turned into a loan would not be reviewed. However, it does um, go against the spirit of the act. Um, and let me ask the other, another question that we've been getting a lot of is, I had 10 employees, I let them all go. I got my PPP money, I brought back six of them, I've given them all a 20% pay raise, the dollar I spent on payroll will be similar to what I borrowed, but the headcount will be different. Will I be forgiven based on the dollars or on the headcount? Both in part. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so we've seen this is happening a lot and they, what should they expect if they only bring back 60% of the people, no matter what they pay them, um, will only 60% be forgiven? Um, April, I, I want to give you a chance. I don't mean to hog the show. No, um, no, go ahead. <laughs> since, we just wrapped yeah, up, go ahead. since we just wrapped, wrapped up the forgiveness calculator yesterday, um, I think I'm a little bit deeper into, into this than, than April might be. Um, so it's a, it's a multi-step process, right? So in the event that you lay off 10 and hire back six, um, there are steps to the forgiveness. So step one is, did you use 75% of the loan for payroll costs? If not, there's a reduction. Step two is the STE reduction, which is a percentage. So uh, it will take the remaining balance from whatever's not forgiven from the first step and take a percent reduction. Um, I think they call it a reduction quotient in the act. And then step three will compare uh, the, the total payroll cost. And if there's a reduction, I shouldn't say payroll cost, that's confusing, salaries, wages, it will compare them for that 25% that decrease from the prior period to the covered eight week period. And that will result in a dollar for dollar decrease. So if you have FTE reductions, you will be subject to that reduction quotient but you might not get a second reduction for the gross wages calculation. So all of you get that out there? <laughs> I know, <laughs> I it's, very of head <laughs> it's very confusing. <laughs> Carrie, might you walk us out, could you do maybe a one minute version of an example? Sure, um, so let me, let me. I sort of put you on the spot, but let's call it 10 employees, $100,000 in wages six people come back, but you still paid them $100,000. You gave them all raises. Yep, okay, so step one, um, step one would be the payroll cost. So $100,000, everyone made 100,000 again in total. So you use the funds in total for payroll. So it's, you're assuming you met 75%, threshold, so it's all forgivable in step one. So you move forward to step two with $100,000. And then you'll have a forgiveness reduction quotient. So if you started with, you started with 10 FTEs, we won't get into the logistics of what is an FTE at this point, um, but you will have a reduction of, of 40%. So you would have to take for the FTE reduction, you'd have to multiply that by the remaining forgivable loan balance, which we'll say is 100,000 again. Um, again, it doesn't factor in any forgivable inter interest that's accruing or whatnot. So at that point, you're down to $60,000 of forgivable um, from the total loan. But step three compares the salary and wages. So overall, that was consistent, and there's nothing in the guidance that says that you have to keep the same employees. Um, so you would have an overall comparative compensation, and you would not have any loss of forgiveness in step three. 
So what is forgivable in this scenario? 60,000 or 100,000? 60,000. Okay. That is going to disappoint lots of folks who borrowed, who got their money early, early on, and it felt like the payroll amount was what was going to be important, not the people. That calculator, y'all, we will give a link to. Um, for everybody, the advice is keep the PPP money separate. When it arrives in your account, move it somewhere and keep good detailed notes because the worst case scenario is that you have a loan with six months of no payment and another 18 months after that to pay it back at 1% interest, right? Um, one, one thing, Aaron, we yes, didn't, in that scenario, there is the ability to, to catch up to catch up to get the full forgiveness to 100 if you if you increase your FTEs back to 10 by June 30th then you can get the full forgiveness i mean you know that you've got to pay those people and 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 figure that out cash flow wise but you that is also an option you have to pay them for 8 weeks or you have to bring them all back on June 25th we need more clarification yeah. on this, especially because with the second wave of funding, the eight-week covered period will extend to a date that's past June 30th. So the catch-up provision becomes a moot point um, if your eight-week covered period extends beyond the period that includes the catch-up. Um, so even on the forgiveness calculator that we're releasing this week, the act and the subsequent guidance is inconsistent. So we actually have a disclaimer on the catch-up period that we need significant guidance to continue um, on how to um, factor in the catch-up. Yeah. So it's still it's still a consideration, and we're advocating for a catch-up because of you know shelter in places and whatnot. And in our AICPA coalition led coalition uh, recommendations, we did ask for flexibility with the eight-week cover period. Um, so firms, firms, sorry, that's my, uh, my ASCK is not coming out, um, for businesses that had to open at a later date due to shelter in places, um, they could pick an eight week covered period. Um, but again, we're so far in the game. We understand some people are already in a position where they're using the funds. So we are. So you are advocating for that eight week, uh, the shuffle the eight weeks, but that's not yet been granted. I did also see in, I think it's FAQ number 42, if you offer someone a job back in writing and they decline you in writing, you will not have that deducted. You will remove them from the denominator of the, frac the quotient. You won't be penalized for them not returning to work, but you must offer them the job and they must decline it. Correct. That's right. Correct. So y'all pay pay attention to that. Was a helpful for some of you who may need to work it out with your employees that you offered them the job and they declined it. Um, and if that's the case, there has been some worry that that will cause them to lose their unemployment benefit. Um, but I have no idea how the feds or the state would ever. How that's that communicated. Right. <laughs> um, they can barely figure out how to pay them, let alone how not to pay them. Um, let me take a few, I see a few hands, and then we've got some Q&A, and we'll do quick answer, uh, quick question, quick answer, we'll do our best. Uh, Ola, I'm going to unmute you. Uh, Ola Stennett is a local state farm agent. Good morning. This is a two-way question really quickly. I, I think they're going to be general questions. So the first one is, I did move the money that I did get from the PPP loan directly into my payroll account. Um, and would I be able to get all the required documents from my payroll provider to prove that I used 100% of it in the PPP? Second question is, during the summertime, I go through a grant that gives me two interns that is funded 100% by the government. I don't pay it, but it does move into my um, payroll account. Will they just scrutinize that I have two more employees than the four that I typically have? Okay, great question. If you increase your employee count, no problem. No problem. I would agree that's not a problem. So any broad increasing of employees, no problem. Second, that those are government funded. That I don't know that complexity. 
you all have a comment on that? As long as they're not also paid with PPP funds and the funds are kept separate, then it should be fine. Um, the Correct. Not the paid with PPP. Right. So the question on payroll, your most payroll companies have figured this out and are providing really good documentation back to you. Is that y'all's experience, Carrie, April? Mm -hmm. Yes. So you should expect your payroll company to be able to give you the documentation needed for the proof to your bank at the end. Right. Yes. Yeah. Carrie and April, the, the loan is between the business and the bank, right? Not between the business and the federal government. Correct. So some of you have worried about federal scrutiny in this, but the loan really is between the business and the bank. Is that accurate? That's accurate, yeah. but the SBA has the authority to come in. And as April said, Mnuchin threw out the word audit, which is different than how accountants know the word audit. Um, but then we also had that new FAQ yesterday that um, alleviated some of those fears for those with loans under $2 million. So let's repeat that FAQ. If you have a loan under $2 million, they essentially will take you at your word on your attestation of it being needed for economic disaster purposes. Yes? Right. The other, the other issue is um, even though there is the ability because of the Freedom of Information Act that the loan and the loan amount could be available to the public to see. Um, so that's, you know, from a scrutiny, from a meet, from a, you know, outsider scrutiny, that has caused some concern also. Excellent. I'm going to move to a few more questions and then I see, um, uh, and you all are able to stay a little longer. And if the rest of you are, we'd be glad to have you. Cynthia. I have unmuted you, Cynthia. Thank you. Hey, um, my question is, it says we can spend 100% on payroll, but we got the loan based on two months of payroll, and that was 75% of the money. If I don't hire someone new, how do I spend 100% on payroll without giving bonuses or increases? Great question. Carrie, April? Right. You're allowed to spend 100% on payroll, but um, you're, you're not required to <laughs> because, like you said, that math doesn't work out without, a, without an increase in payroll. Well, so, let me actually ask you that. You, yeah. were, you calculated based on two and a half months Half of month. payroll, which is 10 weeks of payroll-ish. Okay. As but compared you, to eight weeks, you right? You have eight weeks to spend it. So that's how several people, you can get to the 100%. Um, you told them two and a half months of payroll is how they did the math, but you only have eight weeks to spend it. So some people say, how can I spend 10 weeks of payroll in eight weeks? And the answer was. You use the remaining funds for the other covered costs that April mentioned. Right. The utilities, rent. Uh, interest. Interest. Is that, Cynthia, does that answer your question? Well, I mean, am I allowed to pay someone who deserves a raise more than what I calculated their their payroll on from before? Or will that be looked down upon and say, no, you gave them a raise? And so that's not forgivable. There's there's no guidance now that says <laughs> you cannot give, you know, you can't give a certain, you know, a certain person a, a raise, hazard pay, you know, like we like we talked about. So that um, is a, seems to be allowed. Um, not to say that they couldn't come out and say, you know, it's only base pay or, uh, you know, there's just no telling what they can come out and say. But based on what we know now, that you can increase payroll to be able to spend the 100% on, um, it doesn't have to match what we know now, it doesn't have to match what you submitted in order to get the loan, the pay rate. There, there is um, a provision in one of the many in our final rules that says um, businesses must do with the money, um, they must use the money in the best way they know at the time that they use it. Whatever if that, that, if that gives you any comfort. <laughs> sure. I'll push you both a little further. 
you would not have any anxiety about somebody giving somebody a raise or hazard pay or a bonus during this time. No. No. Not, not based on what we no. know. Yeah. You should not give yourself a 400% raise and bring back none of your people. That would be bad. But we've seen that. Well, that would, that would hurt your forgiveness anyway because of the not bringing back all the people. So. Cynthia, is that a closer answer to you? And even um, bonuses and raises seems to be just fine. And and one other thing though, there is the hundred thousand per person limit. So there is a hundred thousand uh, for the eight week period is annualized fifteen thousand three hundred and eighty five. Mm -hmm. um, so you can give them a raise, except for they're going to be limited to that amount. Okay. Does that All right. Sense? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kate. Kate, I've unmuted you. Will you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Kate. Um, I had spit out a bunch of questions that I think have gotten answered. One I'll repeat because um, Scott Maitland had the same question. We have one employee who left. She had to take care of a child with special needs. Um, so I'm not sure how that will count against us with the FTE. And then the second question, um, I'll repeat what I think I understood and then just correct me if I'm wrong. It sounds like utilities is a very broad definition that you guys do not have any further, um, detail on. So, um, or if you do, please expound. I'm curious if utilities can include things like um, internet or printer and copier contracts. Um, and also we pay our folks monthly. And so it goes back to the question of, can we use our payroll as incurred costs or does it begin with the time that we receive the money? Those were my three questions. Those were great. And those are hearing from lots of people. Let's start with the employees. The employee stays home for childcare. So, uh, we don't have a clear answer on that. I'm hopeful that there will be some kind of additional information about other reasons besides asking them to come back and they just said no. Um, but at this point, we don't know anything. Then for the question about utilities, I'm going to read out to you. We, uh, the ASCPA actually has um, FAQs. In addition, um, they can be found on that same site that Carrie mentioned, ASCPA.org forward slash SBA. So I'm going to read out what it says about utilities. But again, I said broad. Electricity, gas, water, transportation, telephone or internet access for service, which began prior to February 15th, 2020. So, um, and then further guidance released uh, adding uh, gas when driving a business vehicle, other common utilities such as garbage collection or security monitoring may also be classified as a utility, but a business should confirm with the lending institution. Um, let's see. Hello. What was your third? Oh, go ahead, Carrie. Oh, I was, was going to say that the what you mentioned about the start date of utilities being 2-15-2020, the service agreement had to be in effect by 2-15-2020. That also applies to any other um, rental for real or personal property, any interest on um, any eligible mortgage interest. The agreement or the service had to have been established prior to 2015-2020. Um, I just wanted to throw that out there. And then I think the last question that I jotted down was about the start of the eight week covered period. Um, currently with the guidance we have, it starts on the day that the funds are received, but we are advocating for flexibility. The other question that she had also was, if she got the money on Tuesday, I'll just make an example. If you got the money on Tuesday, but you processed payroll on Monday, or you processed payroll on Wednesday, is it about the payroll that took place in those eight weeks? She pays monthly. Um, some people have talked about moving their payroll to weekly to maximize the payments made in the eight weeks. Any comment on accrued payroll versus paid payroll? 
we love to be able to answer that question. Had it a lot. I, uh, Carrie, I don't know what's your. What do you think your best, our best guess <laughs> is? Because it's not clear. It's not clear on that. It's not clear. And in that recommendation document where we did ask for flexibility of the eight week covered period, one of the recommendations we did make was to align it with um, payroll. So it would sort of address um, that paid and incurred in a roundabout way in the sense that like in this example, if you process payroll um, Wednesday and received your funds Tuesday, you could use the funds for the payroll that was paid on Wednesday. So it would Even take out the, right. was it incurred during the eight weeks? Not really, but it was paid uh, and it aligned with a payroll pay date. So is it fair for them to assume it may be one or the other that they will let you use whichever is? Do you think they'll let you use whichever is most favorable or do you think they will decide? You mm. don't know. Don't know. We're asking I, to let the, the borrower decide. Um, okay, I'm gonna go back through the chat feature now uh, to see some questions that folks have. If anybody, let's see. Um, and we're grateful for everybody's being here. Um, calculate just, I, th so one of them is the payroll question, which we have just said is unclear. Um, and I'm sorry, it can't be any clear. You know, we we expect, and from all that we are hearing, is that they intend to help you use it, and that they likely are they're working to find a way so that you can either be the money you spend during that period or accrued during that period. But it's just uncertain. Um, yes, the PowerPoint will be made available, both the PowerPoint and this presentation. If we are planning to cut FTE staff hours by 80% and their salaries proportionally, uh, will this affect forgiveness or is the allowable just the 75% of the loan? Okay, I, I know this question because it was asked to me before. In order to make it through, they gave everybody a 20% pay cut. So everybody makes 80% of what they made before. Um, will this affect they're for they're cutting staff hours, I guess is how they're saying it, and salary goes down also. So everybody's working 80% and getting paid 80%. How would this impact the forgivability? It's there, not they say you'll be punished if you do it by more than 25%, right? Right. Um, also, anyone with an annualized salary for any pay period in 2019 is excluded from that reduction. So if you had someone making 125,000 based on any pay period in 2019, and you reduce their pay by more than 25% in 2020, um, based on the, the comparison period, um, it, they are not factored into that reduction. So that's one caveat to that. Um, the second is if they're salaried, um, then they would just count as the FTE. So there would be no hourly considerations, even if their hours are cut, um, in theory, without any further guidance on how to define FTE, a salaried person is one FTE. So there would be no reduction based on the FTE quotient. And then the second consideration um, for the third step of the calculation process, um, correct, if their salary and wages are not reduced by 25% or more, there would be no dollar for dollar reduction. But if they paid everybody 100000 everybody took it uh, collectively, everybody took a 20% pay cut, so now they paid everybody $80,000. It is only the 80000 that will be forgivable. Is that Not correct? if they also used it on the remainder of the loan on other eligible expenses. See, so the way to maximize your forgiveness on this one is to find a ways to spend the money in other ways. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, continuing down into some of our questions, we had questions about utilities, printer, copier contracts. Do those count? Did you say? Real or personal property agreements do count. Do count. As long as, again, the contract was in place prior to 215 2020. 
Um, let's see. Somebody was allowed to use their 1099 contractor expenses to calculate their loan amount, but will 1099 contractor expenses count as payroll for forgiveness purposes? No, that's an easy answer. No. Even if their bank let them do it, which they, it sounds like shouldn't have, um, what you spend on a 1099 does not count for forgiveness. forgiveness. You right. may spend this money on 1099 employees. You just may not spend it and be forgiven. Is that correct? That's right. The idle loan. Early on, the idle, when it thought it was going to give you an advance, they said that there was going to be a relationship between the idle and the PPP. They then converted the idle advance to a grant. What is the relationship between what they might have gotten from idle grant and the PPP? Sure. So, again, there's kind of two steps to this because initially the grant um, was supposed to be factored in in the forgiveness step. If, if, if the idle was refinanced into PPP and there was a grant associated. So, let's say you had. I'm going to keep it easy with round numbers here. Let's say you had a hundred thousand dollar idle and you got the full ten thousand dollar grant, and you subsequently found out about the PPP, and you decided to refinance your idle into your PPP. In the earlier stages, you would have done nothing with the idle except say you wanted to refinance it, and then when it came to forgiveness, you would reduce your eligible PPP forgiveness by the grant amount. So. That's the relationship, is that the grant's already forgiven, so you can't be forgiven for another portion through the PPP program. And later they came out and they said, if you refinance, you'll actually reduce your, um, your total maximum um, PPP calculation amount by the grant. So later they were saying, if you apply for the PPP loan, and you want to refinance your idle into PPP, you will actually do your 2.5 times your average monthly salary and then reduce the grant automatically. So that was the relationship between the two. It, it might have changed depending on who applied when and if they chose to refinance their idle into PPP. We have not met anybody who wants to refinance and we have not met anybody who's gotten an idle loan. I think there's only two or three companies that if others have it, if you refinanced it, you'd move it from a 30 year term to a two year term. It doesn't seem favorable to refinance your idle into a PPP. So that's probably unlikely. But the grant, if you got a $3,000 grant and also an idle loan, is it not true that those will function independently? As far as the guidance says, yes, you have to refinance for them to have any sort of interplay. So if you don't refinance your idol into a PPP, then they are completely separate and you shouldn't be concerned about their relationship. Is that correct? To the best of our understanding, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, what kind of documentation do you expect people, any advice about how to document to prepare for most forgiveness? I think maybe that forgiveness, um, you want to talk, Carrie, about that, the forgiveness recommendation? Uh, sure. I mean, yeah. We don't, yeah. we don't really address documentation. Um, part of the problem is without guidance. Um, right. We don't 100% know what to say. And I know there was an article out by Tony Nitty and Forbes where he actually asked the question, who is ultimately responsible for determining what's forgiven? Um, we assume it will be the lenders because they had say in the application process um, and it's hard to know know 100 percent which each lender will look for so uh, that's kind of the, the the sticky situation we're in right now um the one thing we did address um we talked about payroll providers so a lot of them are working on specific reports and also for any other additional um, covered expenses that you use. Um, we talked about like canceled checks, statements, um, anything to show what was paid, when it was paid, um, 
again, going back to that pay to earn curd thing, that if it shows the dates of service um, as much as possible, um, there will be obviously an application for forgiveness. If you do not know what that looks like, what that looks like and what additional information would be necessary. Um, so the best we can say right now is just to have your ducks in a row basically and um, maintain all the records you can so that you can hopefully go to your lender and say, everything I have, just give me your, your application for forgiveness and you'll be good to go. And, and that's another reason why we've said it's not required, but it's probably a best practice to have a separate bank account so that it's very clear what's, you know, here's the PPP funds in, here's the PPP funds out, here's what they were spent on, you know, is it payroll, is it rent, you know, what it, what it is. So just um, to make it as, you know, as clear as possible. One of the questions was they got it into one bank, they'd rather it be living separately in another bank. You agree it's fine to move it, but um, any concerns about moving money between banks, just so long as they keep it separate? No? I mean, because it's not a requirement to have a separate bank account at all. Um, from the from, Unless the lender, I have heard certain situations where the lender required a separate bank account. So, um, and, and the lender may have requirements, but as far as we know from the operation of it, no let me ask a restaurant. Let me ask a question that pertains to lots. Of, it's in the chat. Pertains to lots of people that were given the money, but while they were closed, so there's no way they can get. They think to the 75 percent payroll. So if they did 10 percent of their payroll and 25 percent, so they borrowed a hundred thousand dollars. They spent ten thousand on payroll and twenty five thousand on rent. Does that work? Does it not need to be 25% of payroll can be rent? So if they only spend 10,000 on payroll, then only 2,500 may be rent. Can you help with that example? Is that, was I clear? They borrowed $100,000. They only spend 10,000 on payroll. What per, how much may they get forgiven for other things? Yeah, so the, the non-payroll expense, um, the wording says, let's see if I can quick pull it up. Um, the non-payroll must be no more than 25% of the payroll. Is that accurate? I think it's loan proceeds. Right. It's 25, okay. not more than 25% of the loan proceeds must be used for non-payroll costs. Right. So, so it doesn't matter what the, yeah. So go ahead, Karen. <laughs> so there would just be a reduction in the total forgiven amount. Um, in theory, you should still be able to get the 2,500 or 1,000, whichever we're talking about at this point, um, for the rent, it would still be eligible and it would not be more than 25% of the loan proceeds. Um, that's also part of the confusion is that there are pieces of the guidance that refer to the loan proceeds and there's other pieces that refer to um uh help me out with the loan what do they call it april i'm blanking they they change their verbiage so we don't know if it's the loan proceeds or if it's the total forgivable loan amount which includes interest yep, right um, yep. whatever they refer to that as let me i'm going to put it even more stark for scott and guy murphy who and the rest of your restaurateurs let's say you had zero payroll you borrowed a hundred thousand dollars you had zero payroll but you still spend 25 percent of the loan proceeds on rent and things yes is that your understanding so if you have a hundred thousand dollar loan you spend nothing on payroll but you don't spend more than 25% of the loan proceeds on other eligible costs. The only, the only caveat to this is um, the, the first step of the calculator is the 75% payroll cost floor have to be 75% of total eligible costs. I'm sorry, I'm thinking this through as I talk. <laughs> April, if you can jump in and save me, I would greatly appreciate it. <laughs> no. so, uh, it's a complicated question. It could be that they're going to have to use it, your guide. But what yeah. I heard you say is that it's about the percent of loan, not about the percent of payroll. 
Right. Right. Yeah. I'm gonna let you guys think a little bit more about that one while I move to the next question. That's the that's a big difference. We had heard it was about it was the relationship of forgivable non-payroll expenses was going to be a fraction of payroll expenses, but instead you're saying is a fraction of the loan proceeds. Yes. Fascinating. I see Sweeta, a local CPA, nodding her head at that. Joel, Scott, and Ashley talking about it. Okay, let's move um, um, along. Uh, on the child care thing, let me just remind everybody that in uh, Stimulus 2, the Family Protection, what was that one called, April and Carrie? The SFRCA. Yes. The Family First uh, Correct. Family's First Coronavirus Response Act. In, in okay. that one, there are clear guidelines about an employee who needs to stay home for child care and an employee who needs to stay home for being sick themselves. Being sick themselves or caring for somebody who is sick. You are to continue to pay them, but the federal government will reimburse you for what you paid them with a crazy calculator. With a credit um, for payroll taxes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, someone said they received federal income tax adjustment on their last payroll. It decreased our federal tax. Why would that have happened? Oh, that may not be related to. I don't know, Lori. Um, don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> Federal tax income on the last payroll. Sounds like it would be unrelated to this, likely. Likely. All uh, response. Um, oh. I think we can jump back to that restaurant question now that I've yeah. had a moment to process. I, I give you a minute, Gary. <laughs> um, okay, so the first, the first step of forgiveness is the payroll cost is a percentage of total eligible cost, right? So let's just use 10,000. If you pay zero in payroll and 2,500 in um, other eligible expenses, what happens is there's a reduction for um, not meeting that 75%. But then as I was looking at it, the second problem is your SPE reduction in step two and your payroll reduction in step three are gonna wipe it out. Right, it's going to be a hundred percent reduction of FTEs. Yep. So um, I got put on the spot on that question. And I got nervous. <laughs> but I didn't think about it either, Carrie. But yes, that's right. So uh, now it's not clear to me. Let's. I messed you up by maybe using zero. They had. They bring back ten percent of their employees. So they're going to have a ninety percent. Reduction, reduction in the in total FTE. forgivable. Right, ninety percent reduction in the FTE. The first floor will be, uh, yeah. yeah, right. So it it ends up being a factor of payroll, not a factor of loan proceeds. Yeah. Scott, are you following this? And guy, I can see the two of you on the restaurant side. For the rest of you, I know there's other nonprofits. You brought back some people. For anybody who brings back some. You're saying if you only brought back 10% of your employees and borrowed $100,000, you would first reduce the forgivable by 90%, then, uh, then try to apply your utility. Okay. You would first reduce by the, the, the we call it the, um, the forgiveness floor. It's not in any of the guidance, but that's just how we try to define it. So step one, is that 75% of total eligible cost, not proceeds, total eligible cost must be for uh, payroll. So the first reduction is based on was 75% of eligible cost used for payroll. Okay. Scott, I see you unmuted. Uh, right. I'm gonna well, let you be the example. This is lots of people's problem, not just a restaurant, but go ahead. That's right. So, you know, us and other organizations mandated by the state to be closed. It's it's all a function of this June 30th date, right? And and where do we sit with phases and all of this kind of thing? And so I understand what you are saying now, which is it's a function of payroll is gonna provide 
how much we would be refunded, uh, A, we're talking about lobbying for things. I know that the Restaurant Association on a national basis is saying that this doesn't work um, for restaurants. So I would appreciate if somebody would lobby and recognize that, that you know, I'm fine with the idea of having to pay back a large amount of this money, but there's no way I'm going to be able to, it would just be throwing money down a hole to bring people back when I literally can't be open. Yeah. Um, we, so, you know. And that's part of what we were talking about, about lobbying for forget for a flexibility in the eight week period. So for, you know, if you're required to be closed or, or, very limited operations, you know, takeout only or whatever um, for that period, be able to move the take the eight week period to, um, you know, to something that when you're allowed to be open. But unfortunately, you know, that we don't know about that. Uh, we haven't heard anything definitive about that for now. So what I'm, so now what I'm hearing is based originally, it made sense to me when you when we thought that it was a function of loan proceeds. But now we're saying that the forgivable amount would be a function of the amount dedicated towards payroll. Towards any eligible cost. I'll say that's the big key, right? So I've already blown through. I mean, so again, using the hundred thousand dollar scenario, um, I've got. I'm going to spend twenty. I've got forty thousand dollars rent, but I'm going to spend twenty five thousand dollars just in rent. I'm going to peg out my my eligible you know, non-payroll pot of money, bam. I'm not gonna come close to spending the remaining 75% that could normally be used for payroll. So my question is, you know, does the 25% and the 10% I say that I pay on payroll eligible for forgiveness, or are you saying that actually only 10% of the 25% will be available? Mm. So many numbers. I know. <laughs> so this is a tough thing to ask of you, but the, the, well, the I mean, I think the way to look at it is if I take if I get a hundred grand and I spend twenty five thousand dollars on rent, utilities, etc., bam, and I spend ten grand on payroll, will the ten grand and the twenty five thousand be eligible for for forbearance, and I have to pay back the remaining sixty five, or instead are they going to say, oh, I'm sorry? You're only allowed to, to be for, you know, only two and a half percent of your loan proceeds is eligible for forgiveness. All the CPAs uh, just care. I know who the other ones are on this call. The other CPAs on this call all nodded to his second scenario. <laughs> what do you all think? This is a tough situation. Um, we're trying to follow the guidance we have. And um, so I, I ha let, me, let me talk through what I'm doing when I look over to my right. I'm not, I'm not ignoring you all. I'm trying to like put in the numbers of the scenario to try and get the best information possible. Um, this will come out in our calculator that we're trying to release by tomorrow. So what will happen if you have a loan of a hundred, we'll say a hundred thousand and, um, the first reduction, I'm just going to walk through that, this if that's okay. That's um, so the, the original loan balance say 100000 The first reduction based on the 75% payroll cost floor, I'm putting in $10,000 for payroll costs and $25,000 for other eligible expenses. In this case, you mentioned rent and stock. So then what will happen is it'll take 75% of your total eligible cost. So the calculator is taking 75% of the 35,000 and saying this is the threshold. You have to pay 26,250 to not have any reduction in the first step of the forgiveness process. 26,500 blah 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 on payroll not to have any reduction. Payroll. On payroll. Related to step one. Okay. Right. So then what happens after that? is that it's taking the difference between those two. So the floor is 26250 but you spent $10,000 on payroll. So automatically, your reduction of forgivable cost is 16250 So that's the difference. So that's step one. Step two 
will factor in your STEs. So it will be a um, dollar for percentage reduction of your total eligible expenses. So in, in this example, let's say you hire back you hire back 10%, so you have a 90% reduction. So then what happens is... I mean, I think you're answering my question, right? Which is, is it's going to be a very small number. Very small percentage right. is going to be forgivable. So <laughs> what, I, would just, okay. I would just say that if we're out there in the lobbying world or whatever, you know, I can, I can, I feel like uh, most restaurateurs would say, well, you know, whatever, but boy, that 25%, I mean, that's a real cost. You're asking me to stay open. It's just, nobody understands the economics of a restaurant. I mean, they, they, whoever designed this was a freaking Silicon Valley you know, worker dude that's, that's, that's spending all the money on payroll. Mm -hmm. And we did, like, like April mentioned, we did ask for flexibility in the eight week, per, eight week covered period. Part of the struggle with getting that period moved is there is a difference in the guidance she went through. So the CARES Act is one level of guidance that was passed by Congress and on final rules in the SBA or the Treasury FAQs are different. Because the eight-week covered period is defined in the CARES Act, getting that eight-week covered period moved is, an act, is requiring an act of Congress um, to redefine what they initially agreed cool. upon in the CARES Act. Yes. Um, so we are, we are lobbying for the efforts to be made to do that. Um, especially, you know, North Carolina, right? Like our stay-at-home orders have been extended in Durham. Um, and the point of this was to, again, keep businesses ready to open and keep staff on. So once this was hopefully all behind us, you'd be able to jump in. And initially when the CARES Act was passed, we were all hoping for two weeks or two weeks. Yeah, that would have been ideal, two months. And then we would have jumped back into regular business as usual. But this is extended longer than people realize. And um, when the funding came out, um, it, we were all hopeful that it would be shorter. And then there were problems and hiccups in the process. Um, you know, Congress wanted to get funding out small businesses as quickly as possible. And now we have these details to iron out that are causing some struggles and don't necessarily encompass every situation, including restaurants that have to be shut down or other non-essential businesses that have to close their doors and can't operate in a capacity that allows them to maximize on the forgiveness piece. Um, so, so I know that's not super comforting. Um, no, I, pre I appreciate you being aware of that and thoughtful about it. And, and you know, it is what it is. But thank you very much for clarifying. Well, and I hope that for the rest of you who in, uh, either you enjoyed or endured that 10 minute deep dive, but for many of you, nonprofits, restaurants, others, very few of you have indicated that if you did let employees go, that you've been able to bring them all back. So this would apply to anybody on the how many you bring back. And it, um, the two limiting factors will be, you will be reduced by both FTE, uh, headcount, bring back, as well as payroll. But, it, and that will affect what you can deduct in terms of non-payroll expenses. So that calculator, we'll share it with you all when it comes out uh, tomorrow. That was super helpful, Carrie. And you tolerated it being put on the spot in front of <laughs> a whole bunch of people uh, really well. That was, a, um, that was really helpful. Uh, to, to many folks, it feels kind of crazy to pay your people not to work. But remember, the federal government designed this as a two-headed coin. Either they were going to pay them unemployment or you were going to pay them unemployment through this way. So paying the people to not do anything is what some businesses have chosen to do. It will be forgiven. And it's keeping them off payroll, off unemployment, and keeping them close to you. The goal was that when you did start back up, you didn't have to go rehire. They would have all stayed with you. Um, so yeah, we are seeing several people paying their employees to do nothing or to do unique work, to go work on a habitat house or to do community projects. You're allowed to pay them to do entirely different things than they were doing before. Um, some of you are paying them to paint your office. Um, so we have, but don't do that. Landon Davis is here with uh, Serta Pro. You can hire him to paint your office. So, um, we asked uh, Carrie in April if they'd stay another 15 minutes. We're now 20 some minutes past that. Would you all share, um, yeah, I'll share the website real quick, the AICPA site. 
Do you have time for just a few more? Do you maybe another five? Sure. Yeah, okay. yeah I'm good. Um, I did also shoot our emails out in the chat. So if anyone wants to grab those and follow up with us later, um, we're happy to continue the conversation and any specific questions at a later time. All right, and I'll pull up your uh, website in just a second. Um, anybody else want to put their hand up and ask a question? If not, I'm trying to think of what questions has not yet been addressed. Uh, go ahead, Lauren. I just unmuted you. If you would introduce yourself and ask your question. Hi, um, I'm Lauren. I own two retail uh, clothing stores, and um, I have several employees that have not come back, but they've all been part-time employees. So as far as headcount and penalties and all that goes on the calculator, um, you know, is it just full-time for your headcount or what's the impact of part-time people not coming back? Karen April. So I can go ahead. <laughs> no, you go, you go ahead. You mentioned the headcount on the application. So. Yeah, the, um, the information on the forgiveness is, FTEs, which again has not been really clarified. Generally, when you're calculating FTEs, a you know if you have two part-time people, maybe they make one FTE. So you know you're comparing, um, uh, uh, you know, a period in uh, in in 2019, or I'm sorry, you're comparing the period. Um, depending on if you're seasonal or not, you're but you compare in the period in the before and then the eight week period, the FTE reduction. So I'm not sure that was. So I'll ask you, yeah. you want to be more pointed in your question. If you brought back one full-time people and three part-times did not come back, are you asking questions like, are you, will you ask it again to see if we can? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So all my full-time people came back. My part-timers are making more money on unemployment. So they're sitting at home, you know, remodeling their bathroom or whatever they're doing. And I just want to know if, if, if they're in, counted in the head count because they're not full time. So I, don't, I guess I'm just confused on what, I guess it sounds like. Let's, let's too. Even more specific. The, How many, let's use three examples. They work 10 hours a week or four, 30 hours a week. As yeah. Well. Sometimes uh, between 10 and 20 hours a week. Okay, so let's say three of her 10 hour a week people don't come back. Will she reduce it by one FTE? She will. Yes. Okay. So you have to, to avoid reduction, you have to offer them their job back. I did that. I sent out a formal letter to all of them. So, okay. and they, they were responded not. that they're not coming back due to unemployment. Half of them have, and the other half are completely ignoring me. <laughs> <laughs> So for so, the ones who reply, they you get a hundred percent forgiveness for that, right? Carrie, if they if they don't reply, is that what you said? No, if they decline, if they decline, right? right. We're not a hundred percent sure how to um, uh, encompass that on the calculator that we have, um, but as long as you have it documented that you offer their jobs back and they did not take them, um, then it's. Basic, the situation is basically assessed in your favor. Um, you did your best to keep the, the small business employees employed. And if they chose um, to not accept, then that was their decision and does not impact your potential forgiveness for this program. So she okay. gets to keep the funds, not expend them on the people, and it will be forgivable. As of right now, right. the information we have shows that it will not impact your FTE reduction. Um, depending on how much they make, it could impact the, um, the payroll reduction for the salary and wages being less than 25%, unless you happen to give a bonus for those that did come back um, to keep it up at the, the pre-crisis pre salary and wage levels in total. Um, but as of right now, it looks like they would be excluded from the calculation because again, you did everything in your efforts to keep them employed. Right, okay, thank you. And then one, one quick, um, also, what about temporary employees? How do you, it, 
can I hire temporary employees for the next couple of months to absorb some of this extra money that I got? So if they were, I mean, you know, we talked about if they're, if you're saying they're contractors versus employees, if they are employees, even on, on a temporary basis, mm -hmm. um, yes, you can. Okay. Right. That doesn't mean that you, you know, you still have to follow the steps in the, in the forgiveness. I mean, you know, you could get caught in any one of the, of the three steps to reduce the amount that could be forgiven. But so I guess after the eight week period, will there be any monitoring of if I have to at that point lay off employees? We just opened back up a couple days ago. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to navigate this with my <laughs> Sure. Uh, not that we know of. Not that we've heard that there will be any um, scrutiny past the eight-week period. Thank you. That was super helpful. Also, Sally used to work for you. She doesn't come back. You can hire Tommy um, to do part-time work as long as he's your employee. He'll count both for FTE and payroll. Mark, you had your hand up. Mark Costley. Mark, you still with us? Um, okay, we're at an hour and a half. There are additional questions. Someone asked whether or not the Q&A in the uh, group chat will be preserved in the recording. I don't, I don't know. Vanessa? I um, will have a document of it, so I can put that in a form to share out. We will cut and paste it. I don't know whether we'll publish it. I don't, some yeah. of you all were asking very personal questions about your businesses and I'm going to keep that private for you. But so we're not going to publish that, but if you wanted a copy of it, Vanessa could give you a copy of it. Is that a fair way to do that? Yes. Um, we will also have a big caveat. This information that we are sharing that Carrie and April are sharing is accurate as of 1131 AM uh, on today, the 14th while we were in this conversation, new information may have come out. We're giving you the best we have at the time we have it. Any final questions as we um, come down? Steve, I'm gonna ask your question for you. Can you hire an owner who was not on payroll before? So vacancies exist, wants to now put an owner as a W-2, is that okay? There is nothing that prohibits that in the guidance that we have thus far. Um, Do you have any anxiety about it? Um, I mean, if it's for, uh, you know, I think you would still have, you would have to have the same thoughts that you would about paying a um, related person or, um, you know, a child that's the same, like, are you paying them salary for it that's equivalent to the services that they're providing? Um, I, I would have that same concern. So the old problems about hiring and paying family exist, but no new PPP problems exist. Not that we know of. I mean, that doesn't mean that in something could come out and say, there could be further scrutiny about that specific issue. All right. Um, I'm going to formally conclude this. I'm not going to go anywhere. I'm going to sit here for a minute. Um, let me thank Antoine Jackson again for his underwriting and sponsorship that helps deliver programming like this. Your chamber is funded by you all. Um, your membership dues make this possible. We're so grateful that many of you have been renewing even in this time of crisis. We're grateful to welcome new members even in this difficult time. And then underwriters like uh, Antoine Jackson, exceptional local business people who choose to market their business through the chamber. The way we say thank you to them is by doing business with them. So do check out Enatech and consider whether or not you need additional uh, technology services for your systems and operations um, the good work that his organization does keeping small businesses up and running uh, and mid-size and large ones as well. 
Let me also say thank you. We are really blessed that AICPA happens to be located. You could be headquartered anywhere and you all chose our market and the talent that we have here. Uh, we are very grateful for April and Carrie to join us today. Um, if we could give them a round of applause, we would be doing that uh, at, this, at this time. I think this is how we do that uh, now. Oh, they are, there is applause throughout. <laughs> you handled incredibly difficult questions on the fly exceptionally well. Um, very well done uh, to two of you. We're very, very grateful. So this will formally conclude the program. That said, I'm going to leave the channel open for a bit. If anybody wants to cut and paste any information out of the chat, we'll leave that there for a little while. And then as you all sort of exit off, um, those who want to talk to each other, talk with me or if Gary or April, can, I don't know if they're able to stay. They might hang out for a second though. <laughs>